I grew up like most of you. I had a family, friends, a decent job, and a modest house in the suburbs. Everything for the first time in a long time was going my way. Until the regime came. This highly trained militant force seemed to come from out of nowhere. And why should I care, you ask? Well, for starters, they overthrew City Hall, shut off the water supply except for select distribution points, and enforced a curfew at gunpoint. And for the first couple days, it took a while to adjust. Then they decided to mess with my family. While I was out restocking water at a distribution station, a small band of regime members broke into my house, beat my wife to death, and abducted my 12-year-old son. And I don't care who you are. The president, the pope, the devil, nobody. I repeat, nobody messes with my family. After surveying the scene when I returned home, something primal in me just snapped. I knew I had to send a message, and that there was only one language these sons of bitches would understand. Violence. I scoured the attic for any semblance of a useful weapon. There were lamps, boxes, and clothes everywhere. Nothing noteworthy in the self-defense department. I stumbled upon a family photo of me with my wife and my son. Hypothetical visions started to flood my brain. My son could be in a slave labor camp, being brainwashed to become a regime recruit, or worse, could even be dead. It was then that I debated just walking back out of the house, turning myself in, and succumbing to a similar fate. As I trudged toward the attic stairs and turned myself in, a faint glimmer caught my eye. I was drawn to this object, borderline compelled to see what it was for some reason. Upon unveiling it, I found that it was a katana I had purchased in my younger years from an anime convention. I figured anything would be worth a shot at this point. I turned to leave with my faith moderately restored. As I descended the stairs from the attic, I heard faint murmurs coming from the kitchen. It appeared that the thugs who ransacked my house had returned. I rounded the corner and prepared myself for any opposition. I had gone through some basic kendo drills in my youth, but I had not done any sparring for several years. I trusted that my base instincts would suffice and entered the kitchen. Who the hell are you? State your business here. State your business here? How cliche can you get? I thought to myself. I knew no words would discourage these ruffians from blowing me away. So I unsheathed my sword and lunged for the closest regime member to me. I grazed his arm with my blade, but my sword had not been sharpened enough to do any serious damage. Then I felt a sharp pain in the back of my head, and I passed out. I assumed it was one of his flunkies knocking me out with the butt of their gun. While unconscious, I thought that this was the end. The regime was going to take me away to a camp, or to shoot me in my kitchen. I was surprised to wake up at all, but more so at the location at which I woke up. I wasn't at my house, I wasn't at an encampment, and it wasn't readily recognizable either. I was also surprised to see whoever brought me here had left me with my sword. I inspected it to see if there was anything damaged, and I surprisingly cut myself on the blade by merely touching it. I couldn't tell from which direction the voice was coming from due to the acoustics of the room. 
I knew that whoever it was meant it sincerely rather than out of sarcasm. I rolled off the bed, still slightly dizzy from the gun-induced headache. I wandered down a hallway for what felt like an hour before I entered into a gathering of refugees. The hallway I came from was guarded by two surprisingly well-armed renegades, one on either side. The one to my left turned to me and welcomed me to the Republic. I surveyed the room and saw the regime's handiwork sketched across their battered bodies. I asked how I was brought here. We've been watching your neighborhood. We heard about the regime's ransacking of your house and waited for them to return to your cul-de-sac to ambush them. Needless to say, we were surprised to see not only them, but you returned to your house as well. So why did you wait so long? I could have died in there. We didn't want to blow our cover until we were absolutely certain that more soldiers were not en route to your position. If we would have been caught, our entire operation could have been exposed to the regime. I honestly had no idea what I could do now that the last remnants of a normal life had been taken from me. I couldn't freely roam the streets for fear of retaliation of the regime, and I couldn't just sit idly by for the Republic to mount a counteroffensive either, considering most of them did not look like they could take a human life even if they wanted to. You are free to do as you choose. It was the same voice that greeted me in the chamber I awoke in. The voice came from a woman who I assumed from her stature and presence was the rebel leader. But know this, if you leave this sanctuary, we cannot guarantee your safety, nor your recovery, should you get caught by the regime. I turned to the rebel leader and said, Sitting around and doing nothing isn't exactly my style. If it's all the same to you, I'd prefer to take the fight to them rather than marinate in a sewer. Don't be so reckless. Just because a small batch of regime soldiers let you get a free shot in this time, does that mean you'll be so lucky next time? Our ability to recover you from your house was a fluke at best. They took my 12-year-old son. I just want to make sure he's safe. I intend on getting him back, with or without your help. I could sense that there was some semblance of reassurance in my words, because some of the rebels approached us and opted to join my campaign against the regime. I was truly flattered, but I told them that they were needed here in case the regime stumbled upon this hideout. So you aren't as careless as I initially thought. Therefore, you may take your leave. We will give you what provisions we can spare. Thank you for understanding our position, and best of luck to you. They escorted me to their secret entrance, gave me some provisions, a handgun, and four clips of ammo. And so, with my katana in hand, I vowed that I would rescue my son from the regime's tyrannical grasp. Nobody was going to stop this suburban samurai. The Suburban Samurai, a radio drama written and narrated by Don Rosenberger. This episode's guest star, Donna Rosenberger. The music used in this episode of Suburban Samurai was composed by Bobby Prince, Do, and Nobu Oimatsu.